We're going to talk about opioid infusions by looking at a case. So Mrs. Jones is a 67-year-old woman who is in the terminal stages of an abdominal cancer. She was brought to the hospital by her family, delirious and in severe pain from bowel obstruction. And after discussing her options and the values um, that she's expressed to her family in the past, they would like to just focus on controlling symptoms. So you initiate the comfort care order set in your hospital, which includes an order for morphine infusion uh, written as 1 to 10 milligrams per hour, nurse to titrate to comfort. In addition to other measures to help relieve the bowel obstruction, you start the morphine infusion at one milligram per hour. So two hours later, the nurse calls you and says Miss Jones is still moaning in pain. So you ask the nurse to increase the infusion now to two milligrams per hour. Another hour later, so now three hours after starting the infusion, Miss Jones is still in pain. So you ask the nurse to increase the infusion again up to four milligrams per hour. Now, several hours later, it's time for shift change and you're getting ready to go home and you check in on Miss Jones, who is now resting comfortably. Now, you come back the next morning and find out that Miss Jones was found by the overnight resident to be hypoxic with a decreased respiratory rate of six breaths per minute. And so she was given naloxone and the infusion was stopped. The overnight team was reluctant to give any more opioids um, because of this, and so now Miss Jones is, is back moaning in pain. So something similar to this actually happened to a patient that I was consulted on during my palliative care fellowship, and I think it's a good case to illustrate the principles of opioid infusions when used in the uh, setting of comfort care. So to begin to understand these meds, we need to really focus on the pharmacology of morphine. So there's nothing really special about morphine that makes it better for comfort care, which is a misconception that I've heard a lot. Morphine is just cheap, effective, and has been around the longest. Really any opioid will do. So choose the med based on a patient's comorbidities and your access and familiarity with the drugs. So nonetheless, morphine and hydromorphone, or Dilaudid, are by far the most common IV opioids that we use in the hospital. And so for this video, I'm going to be talking about those two meds. I want you to, to take note that fentanyl is also fairly commonly used, but fentanyl does not share the same pharmacokinetic properties that morphine and hydromorphone do. So what I'm talking about in this video does not apply to fentanyl. It's a bit different in that case. The first thing we need to talk about is the therapeutic window for opioids and how to find it. So for many drugs, some that uh, you might recognize are amiodarone, uh, lithium, um, or some of the anti-epileptic drugs, there is a known serum concentration uh, that is known to be therapeutic. And so we calculate a dose uh, that will likely get us to that therapeutic level. Now when we're talking about opioids, there's so much inter-individual variability that we don't know what particular serum concentration we're going for. So we need to find that on our own. So for this individual here, um, I'm just going to arbitrarily draw this green dashed line to represent a serum concentration of opioid that is going to be therapeutic. So that means it's uh, once we reach this threshold um, of serum concentration, the patient is going to experience pain relief or dyspnea relief. Now, also when we're dealing with opioids, there are side effects. So one that we're all worried about is respiratory depression, but always before respiratory depression will come sedation. So this red dash line is going to represent the serum concentration where we achieve toxic effects. So the first amongst those will be sedation. So what we need to do then in our dose finding is what dose of opioid gets someone above this therapeutic window but not 
too far into the toxic levels. So we call this space in between here the therapeutic window. Now that I've established the concept of therapeutic window, let's talk about how to get there. Now remember how I mentioned that morphine and hydromorphone both have similar pharmacokinetics. One of the properties they share is linear or first order elimination. So what this means, if you dig back uh, to your memories from med school pharmacology classes, is that when given at regular intervals, they'll reach steady state in four to five half-lives. So depending on the dose that I use, my steady state could end up below, within, or above the therapeutic window. But let's just assume I've picked a good dose. What does this look like? So let's go back to the graph here. So I'm gonna relabel the x-axis in half-lives to make this concept more clear. So for morphine and hydromorphone, whether they're given IV or PO, the elimination half-life is the same, or about three hours. So we're gonna relabel the x-axis here. So, so here's one half-life, two half-lives, three half-lives, four, and five half-lives. Okay, so let's imagine giving single doses, whether that's a tablet uh, in PO form or injections. So you have a rise in serum concentration, and then it starts to fall off. And then you're giving it at regular intervals, so I'm giving another dose here. Um, three hours later, I give another dose here, another dose here, another dose here. And so after repeated doses, as long as I continue to give them at regular intervals, you're going to hover around this steady state concentration. So when you start an infusion, it's the same concept. You end up getting a smoother um, version of, of what the individual doses look like. So to start a continuous infusion, you'll have a rise in serum concentration that looks something like this. So even if you choose an infusion rate that will reach steady state here, um, end, ending up in the therapeutic window, it won't reach that steady state for about four half-lives, or 12 hours in the case of morphine and hydromorphone. So that's 12 hours, or one hospital shift, where the patient doesn't have good symptom relief. So for this reason, you need to achieve rapid symptom relief and then be able to treat breakthrough symptoms while the infusion is taking effect. So that's this time here from zero to um, when you know that the infusion has taken effect. Furthermore, despite our best educated guesses, we may not pick a perfect infusion rate from the get-go, so we're going to have to titrate it over time. But we'll cover drip titration in another video. So like I said before, we don't know yet how much morphine or hydromorphone we'll have to give in order to achieve symptom control. So through a system of informed and cautious dose stacking, we can get there most of the time. So for opioid naive individuals, um, we usually start with doses um, for morphine uh, in the range of two to five milligrams IV and for hydromorphone we usually start in the range of 0 0.2 to 0 0.5 milligrams IV. For opioid tolerant individuals um, what I'll do is start with a dose that is about 10 to 15 percent of their prior 24-hour usage or the equivalent of 10 to 15 percent. So prior 
use. So let's use morphine as an example in an opioid naive person. So I'm gonna take my two milligram starting dose and administer it here at time zero. And I'm gonna wait here about 10 minutes. So IV morphine and hydromorphone both reach peak effect in about 10 to 15 minutes. So now I reevaluate the symptoms. And if they're still moderate or severe, I'm gonna give another dose of morphine. So my practice is that if the symptoms are not controlled and in the moderate range, so for pain um, example, I would say pain in the moderate range in five to seven out of 10, um, I might repeat the same dose, that two milligrams for example, or increase it by 50%. So in this case, I would increase it to three milligrams. So give another two to three milligrams. Now, if the pain or symptoms are in the severe range, I'm not gonna putz around with another two milligrams. I'll increase my dose by 50 to 100%. So in this example, I would give another three to four milligrams. So going back to our case here, I'm reassessing after 10 minutes. I gave two milligrams here. And after 10 minutes, the patient is still describing severe pain, eight out of 10. So I'm gonna give another three to four milligrams for my next dose. So say I give four milligrams. After that, the patient will say, hey, thank you so much. My pain is down to a three out of 10. So I've achieved rapid symptom relief. And oftentimes you can get there after just one or two doses. Um, but if not, I'll repeat this process until I achieve um, target the, the um, target for symptomatic relief um, for pain or dyspnea. So, you know, in this example, I may, you know, give four milligrams if I'm still in the moderate, if the person's still in the moderate um, uh, range of pain, I'll then give another four or even six milligrams increasing um, uh, to 50%. If it, they're in severe pain, still after this two, then four, um, I'll sometimes give another eight milligrams. So you'll notice um, that I gave a range here. And so this reflects that there's room for judgment here. What I described is my practice, but there's no hard and fast algorithm here. So more often than not, like I said, you get good symptomatic relief after just one or two um, doses, if you've picked the starting doses correctly. So my dose adjustments are usually big in the beginning, but more fine-tuned as we get closer to symptom relief. So in that way, it's kind of like parallel parking. You're making big moves with your car at the beginning and then make small adjustments and fine-tune as you squeeze your car into a tight spot. So the take-home point here is that an infusion takes 12 hours to reach its steady state, four to five half-lives. So you need to be prepared to give boluses at the beginning while you're waiting for that infusion um, to achieve steady state. Let's finish up by revisiting the case from the beginning through the lens of pharmacology to see what went wrong. So at time zero, the morphine drip was started at one milligram per hour. We now know that we would have to wait about 12 hours to know whether the steady state concentration would end up below, within, or above the therapeutic window. At two hours, the well-intentioned resident turned up the drip to two milligrams per hour. In hindsight, we know that eventually this would have fallen within the patient's therapeutic window. But again, we couldn't really know that until we had waited another four half-lives or 12 hours. Next, with good intentions but incomplete knowledge of steady-state pharmacokinetics, the resident turns up the drip again only one hour after making the previous adjustment. By the end of the day, about eight hours after the drip was started, 
the patient was comfortable and not overly sedated. Therefore, at that point in time, we can assume that the concentration of morphine was within the therapeutic window. But in hindsight, we now know the 4 mg per hour drip was not yet at steady state. As the serum concentration continued to rise, the patient developed somnolence and then respiratory depression. Now we can look at what would have happened in the ideal scenario. Rapid symptom relief would have been achieved by giving one or more bolus doses of morphine right at the get-go, uh, right as the drip is simultaneously started. So it's okay to start the drip at a conservative dose like one milligram per hour. You can always give more morphine, but it's hard to take away morphine if you give too much. What we might have found is that after initial symptom relief, pain would recur and additional boluses would need to be given to boost up serum concentrations of morphine back into the therapeutic window. By 12 hours after initially starting the drip, if we were still having to give additional bolus doses, we could be confident that the steady state concentration of the drip had been reached and was not enough, not within the therapeutic window. Then we would know it's safe to increase the drip. Again, we can always give more, but it's hard to take away opioid that you've already given. All right, so I hope you've learned something from this video. Um, I'm planning on making another one to talk about titration, uh, more specifically about titration of opioid drips. <laughs>